Hello and welcome to Different Leaf, a show for new and experienced cannabis consumers. I'm Britt Smith. This week, we're going to talk about all the ways that cannabis can help military veterans. Just a quick warning, this episode we will be touching on some pretty sensitive topics, including suicide. In a country without nationwide health care, one of the main draws of military life for lots of young people who join is that when they get done with their service, they know that they can get access to VA hospitals, a network of medical centers run by the Department of Veterans Affairs. Right now, there are 9 million veterans enrolled in the VA healthcare system. There's around 150 VA medical centers and more than 1,100 outpatient sites across the nation, which makes it the largest integrated healthcare system in the United States. And while the VA staff are working hard to treat our war vets, many former military members still say that they don't have access to the kind of care they need for both the physical and mental issues associated with their line of work. And the data backs that up. Firstly, many states with high veteran populations like Florida, Texas, and California usually have extremely long wait times for appointments, like more than six months for issues that need immediate attention. Studies show that about 25% of veterans live more than an hour's drive away from their local VA hospital. And according to an analysis by USA Today, at roughly 70% of VA hospitals, the average time between arriving at the emergency room and being admitted is longer than other public hospital ERs, often by several hours. So understandably, in recent years, as veterans finish their time in active service, more and more of them have started going to medical marijuana doctors. There, for a few hundred bucks, they can get quicker access to individual care and at least some guidance on how to use a medicine that can help with a plethora of common veteran issues, cannabis. It can help with PTSD, pain, depression, and the anxiety associated with re-entering civilian life. And none of it has the addictive qualities of the pharmaceutical drugs that they're likely going to get prescribed at the VA. As always, the law is taking a while to catch up with what patients are actually doing to self-medicate. But there is some movement. The US House just approved a bipartisan amendment to a spending bill that would allow VA doctors to recommend medical cannabis to military vets. But back in April, a bill to research cannabis for pain in vets was rejected by Senate Republicans. And in early August, the VA itself put out guidance that reminded VA doctors that while they should discuss and document all veterans' cannabis use, providers are still prohibited from recommending or making referrals to veterans for participation in a state-approved marijuana program. So what exactly can cannabis do specifically for military veterans? Why do so many of them turn to it when it comes to physical and mental health? And should they really be concerned about losing benefits from the VA if they're also medical marijuana patients? This episode, we're going to hear from an army vet who not only found that cannabis helped with many combat-related issues, but who actually credits the plant and the cannabis community with saving his life. Staff Sergeant Philip LaFontaine was stationed at Fort Bragg Army Base in North Carolina. He served for more than a decade as active duty and left as a team sergeant in the 95th Civil Affairs Brigade. He was part of a special operations airborne unit. Translation, he jumped out of a lot of planes. Philip deployed several times, leaving his wife and three kids at home and spending months at a time under intense amounts of stress. But like many vets, Philip found that he could use his training to keep cool on the battlefield. It was once he was faced with leaving the military and entering civilian life, where he didn't know who had his back, that he found cannabis was clutch for making it through each day. Now, Philip is part of the management team at one of the coolest new cannabis dispensaries in the state of Massachusetts, Six Bricks in Springfield, where he uses his experience self-researching with cannabis for his own ailments and his many years of education to help other veterans and other consumers really hone in on what kinds of cannabis would help them best. We'll be right back to chat with Army veteran Philip LaFontaine. I basically transitioned from retail manager to general manager. Then we saw some gaps in some other departments. So I'm now head of retail and security, which I think suits me well as I have a 12 year military background, right? So the security piece is basically second nature to me. And, you know, I'm just really happy to be here. (laughs) I think that um, one thing I learned towards the tail end of my military career was 
what does job satisfaction look like to you, right? Yeah. Like, how much do you really want to grind away without any sort of happiness, right? Mm -hmm. And I struggled a lot with work-life balance in the military. You know, I did 12 years, 11 active, one in the reserves. I spent Wait, my which time. Which branch were you in? I was in the Army. No. So I did six years. Uh, I enlisted in 2008, did six years as military police. I did three rotations to Afghanistan in that time. Short stint 08, 09, 2010, 2011, then again in 13. I decided to make the transition to Special Operations Civil Affairs. And that was pretty rigorous transition. There's a selection process, a tryout process, a qualification process. Hmm. Oh, that took about two years before I could even, you know, start doing that function. Mm -hmm. And then once you get into the Special Operations community, you're basically like 1% of the 1%, right? Wow. And so the operational tempo in which you move and have to go on different missions and things like that was pretty high. You know, mm -hmm. we're looking at, you're away for six months on a rotation, you come back for about a year. But in that year time, there's probably another good four months that you're gone doing training events or doing readiness activities or whatever the case is. All throughout this, I had three kids in four years. Wow. Right? Um, and so... Shout out to my wife, Andrea, for being like the rock of the family and super supportive through my military career and my transition into civilian world, right? Yeah. And so... Where were you stationed when you were with your... I spent six years at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which was really nice. I really love the Tennessee area. Southern hospitality is a real thing. Yes, it is. The big change from when I, you know, I grew up in um, Massachusetts here, I'll claim Southwick um, as my hometown, and... Uh, so it was nice being down there. And then when I switched over to special operations, I was stationed at Fort Bragg uh, for the remaining five-ish years. Is that North Carolina? Yes. Right. Yes, yeah, North yeah. Carolina. So you stayed sort of east ish Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Wow. So that's a very long time to be involved in military life. And then switching over to civilian life is a major transition. I'm married to a Marine Corps veteran. Okay. So I know all about that transition. We got together in between his first and second deployments um, to Afghanistan. So I was with him for his second deployment. And then about four months after getting back from Afghanistan, he got out. And it was like, not just a change from coming back from war, but also a change from getting out of the military and into school and into just civilian life. And that's when it dawned on me how useful cannabis was for veterans just as a daily medicine as something that could help with anxiety and adjustment and flashbacks and PTSD. There was pain. Like this guy just from just from running around with a 100 pound pack on his back in the sand has stress fractures on his ankles. Absolutely. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons why cannabis was working for him. But when we first tried to get some for him, he was very afraid of losing his VA benefits that he just got. So there was, you know, this was back in 20. 14 when okay. he got out it was california it was a whole different world and he was very afraid to have medical mar marijuana patient on his anywhere on his record what year did you get out and what was the situation for medical absolutely so i ended up getting out of active duty in 2019 and then the pandemic had kicked off and i was in the reserves and i was drilling out of danbury connecticut and so we kind of transmissioned to this weird remote model right mm -hmm. um and so at the time because i was just doing it part-time right um i was going to school here in springfield american international college so the transition for me was like okay What's that next step in my life? So I had a large passion for fitness, wanted to get into strength and conditioning, going to school and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. And working through basically how I was going to finally transition completely out of the military. And I, what I started to notice was that around that same transitionary time, small symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder started to come up for me, yeah. right? Well, yeah, even, even so, when I was still in active duty, I would say probably the year before I, I got out, I was running and training to work with Ranger Regiment, and I would just have heart palpitations. And I'm like, am I running too hard? You know? Oh, yeah. And so to be honest with you, I, I kind of took a risk, and I started using full-spectrum CBD while I was still in service. Oh, wow. And that's something that is, you know, frowned upon. It is not you know, really legal in their regulations and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I needed something to start to deal with some of the anxiety and some of the chronic pain. Uh, to your point is I jumped out of airplanes, carrying heavy packs, the whole nine, right? Yeah. And what was really 
kind of the catalyst for, you know, a complete transition and revelation and eye opening into cannabis was the symptoms of PTSD started becoming more intense and more intense and more intense. Mm. And so I, I realized some of the things that I would do before I couldn't really function. I wasn't as clear focused. Uh, I remember actually being at a reserve drill and we were out to eat in a mall and I had a panic attack right in the food court, yeah. like blacked out, like none of my buddies knew what was going on. I had to internalize it all. Right. But like large crowds were, were getting to me and things like that. And so uh, once I finally got out, I was like, okay, I can no longer get in trouble or be tested for it. Right. So let me start using it. Right. right. So I started using it. And of course I went to the streets first, you know, I had a guy, I knew this and he's telling me he's got fire. It's this and that. So I'm trying it. Um, reflecting on it, it was all poor choices um, <laughs> because I didn't really know what I was doing, right? I wasn't educated. It was literally trial by fire. I was like, man, I used to do this when I was 17. I really enjoyed the recreational experience out of it. But now I'm looking for something more medicinal, but I don't know too much about it. Right. So I would be smoking sour diesel or something like that, and that would just exacerbate my anxiety. And then something that I, I don't think is talked about enough, too, as we're looking at June for PTSD Awareness Month as well, is that, you know, there's a large glorification of alcohol consumption in the military, right? Yeah. And so I had, you know, my fair share of, you know, alcohol abuse on my transition, getting through, trying to find what was going on with me with PTSD, why I was having these feelings, why I was um, going through this. And so I had cold turkey quit alcohol. And While got you were rid in? Of all that. No, this was, this was, this was right at the transition. And, and, and sorry if chronologically it's a little off, no, but a no. lot happened basically 2019, 2020 yeah. when I'm making the transition from active reserves to civilian life um, and the PTSD symptoms started coming up. Mm -hmm. And so I was self-medicating from both angles to suppress a lot of it, to be honest with you, right? And it took a lot for me to go get help. And it came to the point where I was having six or seven panic attacks a day, full out tremors passing out the whole nine and um i had just had enough and i couldn't find what was nothing was working for me i felt like my whole life was upside down i could be in a firefight and be calm cool collective now that i'm here i can't go to the store without having a breakdown and i really thought i was broken i was suicidal yeah. right and that was very difficult it came to the point where i had no choice but to reach out to the veteran crisis line to seek help and so I did, and I was brought into, you know, the clinic and kind of brought through a little detox period and things like that, and then got a lot of Western medicine therapies and things of that nature. Secondary to that, the typical Western medicine pharmaceutical approach was put on me. I was described things such as Zolov and, you know, Trazodone to help with anxiety, depression, and sleep. That's and what the VA does, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, I, you know, I was transparent with the VA as well, where I told them, I said, hey, you know, I use marijuana products and you go look at my medical records right now. It says cannabis use disorder. Oh, wow. I'm classified as having cannabis use disorder. And I think that's really interesting because it really highlights that that line where it's like, hey, we're a federal entity. Yeah. We acknowledge that it's not federally legal. So now we're classifying you as having a substance abuse issue. Right. right, and that's going to impact other things that they want to give you, how else they want to treat you in the future, mm -hmm. and how they talk to you about your health. And through my experience, I was at such a low point. I had been like, hey, I reached out for help, so I'm, I'm willing to try anything. Yeah. So go ahead, give it to me, right? And I went through the gambit, and it was just exhausting. Take things, and now I got this going on, and et cetera, et cetera. So I needed to refine myself, right? A lot of self-exploration through that. Lots of deep therapy sessions. Grateful for some folks out there at the VA. I did cognitive processing therapy. I did EMDR therapy, which is extremely intense. That's very helpful, I think. I uh, tried that too. Yeah. For it, PTSD. Yeah. It was really strong. The EMDR therapy was probably the most productive yeah. uh, therapy that I went in. And I had done a 30-day inpatient protocol here Northampton Mass leads at the VA. They have a phenomenal PTSD program, only one of two in the entire country. Wow. So what the coincidence is that I'd get discharged and come right to the center of excellence for PTSD management and wow. clinical treatment. Yeah, right? yeah, fake. I just dove in head first. I had no other option. And I remember doing EMDR therapy uh, once a day, probably 14.